Hi, everyone. It's Joe Venary, the host of Fit Insider, the show where I talk with the entrepreneurs, executives, and investors who are redefining the business of fitness and wellness. Today, I'm joined by Paul Bowman. Paul's the CEO of Wexer, a leader in digital fitness focused on connecting gyms with members anywhere. In today's episode, we talked about personalizing digital fitness, how COVID-19 is accelerating the shift towards omni-channel fitness, and how AR and VR will impact the industry. Let's get into it. Hi, Paul. Welcome to Fit Insider. Thanks for joining us. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. Yeah, excited to ta- talk today. And, and just to kick things off, can you bring the listeners up to speed on what you're working on at Wexer? Yeah, yeah. So uh, just probably a little bit of an intro. So, so we, we're a, um, a B2B to C uh, business. But, but so essentially at our core, we help group ex- deliver group exercise content and programming to our clients, members, anywhere, anytime on any device. So uh, that for us essentially means, you know, no dead space um, in, a, in a studio, you know, a traditional health club or kind of the ultimate freedom on, on, a, on a mobile platform. So, um, yeah, what, what I guess what we're, what we're working on uh, right now is, is all about trying to con- have, create a connected um, fitness experience. For us, we are a white label platform. So we're working with, um, you know, the majority of the top 25 operators around the world. Um, and and delivering you know uh, value to their clients both from, from an online and offline point of view. Perfect, and that's you know really across the board, just increasing access and convenience to to fitness content. Um, and we'll get we'll get into that a little bit more. But you mentioned it there some of the the top gyms that you're working with. But just can you give us context? How many gyms? How many users are accessing classes? Yeah, so right. So in 2019, uh, we delivered over 10 million fitness experiences. And, and of course, the business has two kind of major streams to it, to its platforms. It's the in-club stream, which um, is where, where, I guess, Wix are virtual, where, where it started. And, and that premise was to kill dead space. So that is where we're delivering, you know, um, video-based content in the traditional group exercise rooms. Of course, it's expanded significantly from that. And then we have the uh, mobile offering, which... You know, we offer um, a web player solution, an app solution, an SDK solution. So, as I said, we're working with the majority of the top chains around the world in, in some format. So, if that's on virtual, if that's on mobile, and and or both. And I, and I think that that's what the future is going to going to hold for Wexer um, as, as we progress, especially because of uh, the current times. Certainly, and I think you know, you guys were ahead of the curve in terms of this idea, not only killing the dead space inside the the gyms, which you mentioned, but also just Mm. increasing access. Can you talk a little bit about, you know, maybe what that, you know, you're going out to sell at the the onset and it may be a little bit of convincing, whereas now that's kind of flipped on its head. Yeah. Yeah. There's, there's a lot that's changed uh, because of COVID, but I'm sure, I'm sure we'll get into that. But I I guess coming back to the, to the start is, uh, we were we were ahead of its time. You know, we were, I guess we've always believed in a hybrid model. You know, we've always said um, right from you know the, when the, bir- the business first started is that the kind of the winner tomorrow will be a blended experience between um, bricks and mortar and like a, and a digital extension that that enables personalization. I think the personalization stuff has come kind of in the last three years, um, but that that's the that's the key premise for us is essentially. You know, being able to offer members workouts whenever, whenever they want, wherever they want, on any device, and, and you know that essentially, you know, for us is we kind of see ourselves as as maybe protecting the health club industry against um, some of the B two C offerings, um, and you know, really what we've what we all of our research has shown is fundamentally people like both. Um, they want they want digital. Um, if that's from a convenience factor or a variety factor or a confidence factor, um, but then they will go to physical and and mix between the two. You know, a lot of our studies have shown that essentially people move on a spectrum um, when they're engaging with exercise on confidence. So they might start out as a digital member um, or, or engaging with online content, build their confidence. You know, what we see, especially with our platforms inside uh, the traditional health club is that they will actually engage with the same content that they do at home in the club. So reducing that intimidation factor. But then of course, what we see is they, they find a class that's similar to that in the live format, but then they, they go through a cycle of, okay, maybe life might change. Maybe they can't um, see that, see that live instructor that they want to see every single week. So therefore they will engage with content or, you know, in an ideal world, which 
again, we'll, we'll talk about, you know, they might start seeing that that, that instructor live streaming uh, in, in, in the near future. So um, I guess that's our headspace at, at all times is, you know, we're definitely not a, um, a business that's looking to just completely take out the gym but by no way, you know, we, we, we know from a, you know, I think all of, if we look at Wex's employees, a lot of us are coming from um, operating backgrounds. And so fundamentally, it's all about how do we just have that variety? How do we have that convenience factor? Um, and how do we deliver a good experience both o- online and offline through the use of technology? Sure. And you mentioned, you know, the, the hybrid or blended. Uh, some folks now are calling it kind of the, the omni-channel approach where there's access at home, on your phone, in the studio, at the hotel even. Um, and with that, I mean, you guys are providing the opportunity for gyms to reach consumers on a number of different platforms and, and however that makes sense for their life. But how are gyms supposed to keep up just in terms of, you know, if they are, I know not all of the, the providers are creating their own content, but um, with just all the platforms and kind of channels and pipes that you can put content into, just how do we keep up with um, reaching these consumers uh, wherever they are? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a that's a that's a that's a big question. Like, I guess that's why we've invested so heavily in our architecture to make sure that we we kind of do that thinking for a club. You know, essentially by by clubs engaging with us, we can be anywhere. They want to be on a you know they want to be on Apple TV. They want to be mobile. They they they. We've made sure that the breadth and depth is able for an operator to support because you know sometimes an operator would would look. At their business and say, hey, I, I want to, you know, I have developers. And I've done the business case. It makes sense that I have developers, but but I still want to take a lot of the functions from Wexer, i.e., on-demand content or or workout generator, and, and that's why we built the SDK. So it's it's really for us, it's it's understanding what the operators' probably overall business goals are, um, looking at where the, there's a that it makes sense to have a decent starting point, and that's when we go into the platform because. You know, I don't think I've ever, well, I haven't seen anyone succeed with executing a fully kind of, let's say, a digital experience or, you know, um, a digital presence by doing all the channels. You know, it, it just, it, it's just too many to keep a hold of. And, and I think a lot of the times, especially what we're seeing from a platform point of view, the members will actually tell you <laughs> what they, where you, where you want us to be. You know, we've got, a, we've got examples of, of the web player is, you know, I think, as we got more and more technical on our architecture, we, re- we realized that actually m- more and more people wanted to go back onto web because they wanted a bigger screen. You know, we, we, were un- we were not that impressed in terms of how much people want to cast. They want a kind of a digital native on their TV. Um, so, you know, it's always kind of, it, it, I think from our point of view is, you know, the lucky thing for us is we're supporting so many clubs worldwide. So we can take Kind of a bigger, bigger data um, approach, and then build platforms that that satisfy that need. Um, you know, I know we'll probably talk about AR and VR and stuff like that. It's you know, it's just essentially making sure the architecture is able to be able to cope with all those platform demands that are that a club's putting on you, but also, of course, what the consumers are putting on you. This interesting point I wanted to, to kind of dig into is, you know, if we are putting out content and making it accessible co- across all the various channels, and then at this point now what we're starting to see is individual brands are standing up their own online and mobile experiences. Of course, you have connected hardware companies that are going direct to consumer as well as fitness apps. Does it just become too fragmented for the consumer? And you know, how do they ultimately make up their mind with all these different options? There's, there's a hell of a lot of options. Um, and I guess that's why our viewpoint is it made, it made more sense from a Wixer point of view to be B to B to C. You know, again, we've all always come from an operator point of view, but that's why we, we're telling operators that they need to have their own platform. You know, fundamentally, it is so fragmented, but it's not fra- fragmented in, the, in, a, in, a, in a world where you're still making a decision based on location, which is fitness, right? You, you're still going to, you're still going to choose you know, the clubs around your desired location, that's easy and convenient for you. But now I think, you know, where we've seen, yeah, I think the new innovation realistically is going to be how do they offer that member experience that's physical and digital, but they have to have their own platform. Um, And that's how we kind of take the noise out a little bit, um, especially from our own business point of view, but also from a health club point of view, because there is just so much going on. But, you know, if you can get, if you can hook them in and you can acquire them like they're doing you know, and they have done for years, then it's all about just adding on that digital experience. And then what we see 
and and you know more and more we're working with operators is they will actually drop their you know traditional B two C apps. You know because we have seen you know someone will have a physical membership but they'll have a digital membership. That's not intertwined from a member point of view. So I would say both are both are at risk. So either I, are the B two C guys going to be able to convert them to that's all they do. And are the clubs going to be able to to offer it? And you know, really, what the, the success that we've had with a lot of the operators that have put in a digital experience is that they will choose that, that to to um, embrace that one brand um, because, of course, those journeys are, are matched up, and then you can start personalising the experience. So it, may, it makes it more relevant to them because, of course, what a traditional digital fitness operator doesn't have is the physical aspect of of um, of the delivery. You touched on it a little bit there. It's, you know, the the differentiation of having that in-person option. So you, you have that leg up from a, a gym perspective. Then there's the the digital offering and the convenience that that brings with it. Um, so we kind of layer on that content and con- content and convenience factor. Um, but then what comes next? You know, personalization is a word that we hear a lot and we're using the data <laughs> to, to inform what it is we want to serve up to the members. But, but what does that actually mean? What does that look like? Yeah. And, and I think, I think that's where, again, I, I see Wex that has an advantage because we have so many touch points, you know, we know, um, you know, if, if, if the app, for example, is completely integrated into their booking system, um, you know, integrated into their, their check-in, check-out, they can upgrade or downgrade memberships. Of course, they can, we can serve up content, we can serve up programming, where we also understand what, if, if they send a workout of the day, if they're engaging with that or not. So because we have multiple touch points, we can actually personalize, you know, like I, I, I personally, if, if, if it was just an app play for us, you know, yes, we could start personalizing based off the fact of, um, you know, content and what they choose. And it can be quite generic, like, hey, they keep choosing yoga. So let's put more yoga in the personalization uh, engine. But then, you know, we, we, we don't, again, it's it's one of the, uh, I think, uh, a strong part of, of Wexer is because we have so many, we understand what they like within live, we can support them what they want digital. You know, if we, if we for example, know that they've, you know, booked a class but it dropped out of a class which so many of us do uh, just before we can hit, hit them with the right options because we know what content they've done in the past um, and that's a really really important thing from a personalization stuff for us because you know we're working again with, with the operators to be able to personalize that experience but the more touch points you have like any personalization the better you can actually personalize and and that's where we're starting to see you know, personalized, personalization not just being a buzzword, but actually just generally adding a lot of value to the users. You know, right now, um, we actually measure when we, we on, our, on our app, we'll have a recommended field. We know now that once we've once we've gone for a journey with the, with that member for two to three months, we know that 80% of our content recommendations, if that's programming, if that's a live class, and or if that's um, on-demand content, they'll choose that. So we're getting better and better, but of course it's you know that's going to evolve over time, right? And 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 understanding kind of big trends and and, and how you can actually big trends and big data to how you can actually make that even better. Sure. And one thing we touched on, I wanted to kind of pivot to and, and address. We we're recording this in April of 2020 amid the the COVID 19 outbreak. Obviously, yeah. this has changed a lot of things, uh, you know, across the world and across every industry. Um, but specifically with fitness, it's really kind of accelerated us towards this digital future and integrated in the hybrid business model um, that we talked about. That was kind of inevitable even before this. Um, so now, even picking up more speed, um, just. At a high level, what changes have you made? How is it impacting the business, and, and just how are you, you know, continuing to deal with it? Yeah, like so. It, look, it, it's it's been completely unprecedented. You know, we've seen over seven hundred percent growth of, of users on the platform. So, you know, the figure that I said in regards to we, you know, we did two ten million fitness experiences in two thousand and nineteen. You know, we're forecasting now over twenty five million, um, just because you know right now the clubs that were engaged with us before COVID. Um, of course, that's their major platform, and, and what we've seen is, you know, some operators look at look at this as the o- only marketing opportunity to ensure that they have a huge database when they come to open up their clubs again. So, you know, we've got operators that had a two million database of members. Now they actually have an eight million on on their platform because they're looking at it as the biggest opportunity to um, really, to be honest, be be um, uh, affect their competition, but also make sure that they're pre-sale when these clubs open up again is, is, is significantly beneficial for them. But I, as you said, you know, fundamentally, this has just been an acceleration 
um, of of what we were seeing beforehand. You know, like I don't. I think I think definitely we're going to look at from a digital fitness point of view. We're definitely going to look at COVID as as um, as a tipping point. I think we'll look back at it as, as as a tipping point. But it is just the acceleration of digitalization for the industry. You know, the the smart operators that we were working with beforehand. Of course, they've benefited significantly because they've got the platform, they've got the infrastructure. You know, some of them have already got live streaming already set up um, at a high quality level rather than just shooting it off their phones. Um, and of course, they're seeing the benefit of that. The ones that move quite quickly to, you know, offer a digital presence, if that's through Wexa or, 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 or others, you know, kind of have, have benefited. But the ones that, you know, unfortunately done a, done a viewpoint of, Okay, we'll just send out a B two C offering because, of course, the the B two C guys are very much happy to take the database of some of these clubs. Um, I think that was a mistake, and, and and I think I think we're we're seeing people come back right now in terms of okay, we need to have our own platform. But again, in terms of usage, you know, over seven hundred percent growth. It's really incredible, and I think you you use the right word, which is unprecedented. And it's not anything anybody could have ever imagined and the impact and the kind of continued fallout We're we're all learning as we go, what we think is going to happen next. Um, you know, kind of to the best of your ability in, in, I guess, in your opinion, how do you see things rebounding for gyms and studios? Great question. Um, I, I think, I think we've definitely got a new normal. I know that buzzword's been uh, thrown out there a lot, but, but it is real, you know, and, and I think, Again, it's an acceleration of what clubs, I believe, should have done. Um, but of course, for hindsight's a lovely thing. But right, right now, you know, my 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 feedback is that we're not going to be operating under the same remit that we used to be. You know, there's going to be social distancing, so we have to think more critically about our um, customer journey, both both digitally and physically. Of course, if you don't have a digital customer journey, then then you need to have one quickly. Um, but physically, it changes as well. You know, I really see that. Um, clubs are going to have to start, and, and, and some of them are already doing this in terms of infrastructure-wise. You know, putting in the ability to live stream their, um, their their kind of rock stars to make sure that that can you know one one session can go across an entire five o'clock slot in in the US or Canada or, or, or something of the like. So so therefore you know because it's not going to be cost effective to be able to have live classes how we're doing it in terms of with the social distancing rules. You know, I I do think that of course. All operators are going to have to work out where and how they want to want to use technology. Um, you know, they're going to have to start thinking about um, the relevance to the user 24/7, 365, rather than just the the hour that they they may may use the club or the or, or the or the session. Um, and then I think you know, I, I I think the rebound is also te- I think going to teach people we're going to have to go through a huge pre-sale again as an industry. Um, so you know, I think during the times whilst lockdown is still happening. We've got to start testing members and kind of potential members or members that you might have lost because so many people's situations might have changed. Um, so I, I actually see a lot of clubs benefiting from this um, uh, long term by actually putting all these the kind of digital enhancements in place because, of course, that's only going to benefit once social distancing rules decrease um and you know fundamentally it, you know everyone this i guess the one thing i love is how much how much people have got into fitness <laughs> um you know even seeing people that you know in, in my neighborhood that would never work out they're just so bored they, they, they want to do 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 some exercise uh which i think is great and i think we really need to kind of ride that wave to try and get these guys from you know platform whatever it is into the fitness industry again um but of course it's not going to be at the same levels in terms of usage that We've seen, so we have to be more creative and, and, and definitely have to think about offering our services 24-7, 365. When it comes to offering the services you mentioned in there, kind of getting the the talent or the rock stars to do live streaming classes, uh, I'm just curious if you maybe have any insights into this. I know in some cases, uh, clubs are, are accessing kind of a media library where it, it may be workouts and, and trainers that they're not familiar with uh, from the end user perspective. And then in, yeah. in other instances, we have, you know, the, the kind of the instructors that you know from your studio who are teaching these classes. Um, yeah. c- certainly not everyone's able to do live or, you know, doesn't have the content production capabilities. Um, but mm-hmm. is there a, a drop off or a risk of just kind of accessing the, the standard media library versus doing live or, or how do you recommend that clubs approach that? 
Yeah, I, I guess uh, well, I think there's I think there's fundamentally two content pools that we've noticed, you know, and and we've been live streaming um, before COVID, but on a very high production level point of view, you know, not I wouldn't say to the levels of anything like Peloton, but but you know, a version of that in terms of so so high production, well well choreographed. Um, instructors and and you know timings and all that sorted so i but I, I think what's changed during covid is is that you know so what we've i guess there's you know the two pools of content right now there's the pre-recorded content which for us we've seen that gives the ultimate freedom of choice it secures high quality um it great, gives great variance and max convenience and then we've seen live streaming which which is the uh, what we've seen kind of on the amateur side of it is more that it's you know it's combining the digital side with social engagement because course as you said it's that instructor that used to deliver my physical session on Thursdays at five now I can see him digitally so there's still that social engagement which I think is critically important but it is limited in its reach in terms of you know one specific class at one specific day so you know what we're saying and I guess what we've learned from this is it's it, it it's kind of all, uh, all of them is a blended experience. So I think you've got well-produced life, and I, and I think more and more people are going to demand that. I think you've got the amateur-ish life that, you know, essentially means that, you know, if, for example, social distancing means that a normal club or group exercise room could only, could have 40, now that's moved down to 10, then stream that person and people, will, will, if they can't hit that class, they'll at least do that do that online, which is, a I think, another category that's opened up. Um and then, yes, yeah, so a pre-recorded live streaming at high quality and then amateur-ish live um, as well. So I think those are the options that I would see club groups moving forward with um, in, after COVID because it just makes the most financial sense. Is there a thought, I know right now it's obviously B to B to C, but what we're seeing kind of with COVID and you, you touched on a little bit there with like the, the amateur filming that in many cases, the instructors have become the brand or business unto themselves. So you have them, they have the social following and it's almost like an unbundling or the value migration from the brick and mortar to the instructor, uh, the personality. Is there a thought to create these white label platforms where, you know, an individual instructor could kind of stand up their on demand streaming business and go direct to consumer? Or is that kind of in competition, kind of contradictory to the the gym studio model? Like we, we, you know, fundamentally we can, we can support both, you know, like we, of course, there's going to be a huge, well, there is a rise of fitness influencers very, very quickly, right? So everyone's become a fitness influencer. Um, does that, uh, you know, what is, well, I guess the, the question mark is, well, how does that transpire when clubs open back up again? Because of course, you know, it's not, it's, it, it, the instructor is an important part of a club experience. But always not the be in an indoor, you know. It's the, it's the facilities, it's everything else that gets offered with it. Um, I think they have to have access to that person at all times, and and you know that's what uh, many platforms are ha- able to do. I guess the question is, will they will these fitness influencers splinter off um, to be able to create their own option, possibly? But I think there's so much talent in our in, in our in our. our you know, an industry that we, you know, I, I don't, I don't see that being an issue. And actually, it's one of those things that actually could just grow the pie, because you know, you see, some people just want to follow a particular person. That's why you know the success of infomercials, many, many years, um, and that that is really important. But fundamentally, it always goes down to, as we see it, is it goes down to you always will end up being a physical delivery. You know, there's many. B2C operators that, that we work with in terms of aggregating their content on the platform, that one of their biggest threats is people going to gyms because they get confident enough on their programs that they go to gyms. Um, but again, so it's for us, it's that blended both, you know. So I guess the other question is, will we see some B2C guys going into the physical space? Um, that's a that's a question mark I'll chuck out there. <laughs> yeah, I think that's it's absolutely gonna be the case. We when you look at Peloton, there's already this idea of like people taking the Peloton vacation to go go visit the studios and do it in person. Um, yeah. A few weeks back, we we had um, Ali Arati from Tonal on, and, and he kind of hinted at you know setting up Tonals with a personal trainer to create that in person experience. So I do think there will be kind of digital operators who back into the physical space. It, it totally makes sense, but I think that's a great thing for our overall industry. You know, the more the more a variety and options we have that for me are connected both digitally and physically, 
that I think that's the sweet spot, and I think that's the big shift that we're going to see um, after COVID because you know digital. You know, I think we we kind of break the the digital uh, cycle into three options. You know, digital presence maybe have something that's that supportive digital experience, and then of course digital transformation. And I think really what we're seeing is people going from digital presence to digital experience. You know, they need to have a product and offering that actually supports their business goals rather than just toying with the option. Right. I think the punchline is that things are changing very quickly and it's only been accelerated. We talked a lot about content and convenience um, yeah. and, and personalization, um, but a few things that also come up uh, are VR and AR um, in terms of how the industry is changing. Uh, kind of where do you stand on this and how do you see it evolving? Yeah, like it's something that we've always been really interested with. We've actually had partners with kind of the early AR um, adopters, but it, but it all fell, fell, fell well, falls apart in hardware. Um, you know, the hardware in terms of an operating operation setting doesn't make sense. You know, we've had um, operators even look at an option of you know buying particular hardware units and sending it as a digital membership. Um, and, and look, I think where we've seen, I think we can write off VR in, in, in a Wexer world like that. We just don't see. You know the how that how that plays plays out from a fitness point of view in terms of how we interlink on demand content and and physical services. It just it doesn't relate to both well. Um, where AR definitely does, but it's all coming down to the to the hardware is the major roadblock here, either from a cost point of view um, or an actual delivery point of view in terms of operationally. So you know that's something that we're constantly keep tracking. You know we're we're definitely. Um, are talking to lots of AR companies right now because you know, of course, it makes sense if you, if you could if you could do a, a session with let's you know let's say glasses on and you can see your live live instructor you know on one side and you can see all your data on the other side. Yeah, you know, it's a bit like doing fitness in the matrix, but you know it totally does present where it could be. But you know we haven't seen really any AR goggles that actually you can really even work out with. You know, they they say they do, but they really we haven't seen it actually play out. So, and we've tested a lot. So, I think I think it's, I think that will come. Um, but I think hardware is a major roadblock right now. And kind of building on that, when you think about the all the opportunities that are there, obviously the value that you can continue to add. How does Wexer innovate to both provide value? It's kind of like you guys are providing value on both sides of that coin for the clubs and also for the consumer. What does that, that roadmap look like for you? Yeah, I think, I think I hate to use the word and, uh, but it's, it's that personalized as a fitness experience. You know, we're, we're, I still don't think we have really even touched on it. Yes. We're getting a lot smarter. Yes. We understand if, if, if we, if someone's engaging with our products, yeah, both, you know, with the club and, and, and the platform, we can understand that user a lot better and, and have a lot more data points to be able to personalize. But, you know, that, that's the key for us. And, and I think, you know, for us is, you know, little things like we're talking about with, with content is constantly being abreast to what the changes are. You know, you know I, I, before COVID, I, I would have said amateur content just doesn't work. No one engages with it. It's not good enough. Um, but that's completely been blown out of the water. Does that still hold true? Post COVID, I think I think it has to because, of course, we just can't. We just don't have the same physical options as we we might needed to. Um, of course, I think you know naturally we'll see people's ability to live stream once social distancing is being reduced, or you know people can go back to work. That that quality will increase and therefore maybe drive the standard back up to a high quality standard of live streaming. But you know for us, uh, the the roadmap is all about how we how we make people. Um, have a personalized fitness experience to ensure that we're, you know, we're getting usage stats far over what we saw in, in the past. You know, for us, we're always wanting people to do a minimum of kind of two workouts, either physical or, or digital per week. Um, of course, we wanted to keep moving that bar up and up and up. So how we do that is, yeah, course personalization, understanding what consumers want, what when, when they want them, um, yeah, and making sure it's enjoyable at the end of the day. Certainly a lot of exciting stuff and, and certainly opportunity in the pipeline. Um, and again, I know this is a busy time. And so I appreciate you taking a few minutes to chat with us today. Uh, where can folks get in touch if they want to learn more about what's going on at Wexer? Yeah, so just jump, jump on the website. So it's just www.wexer.com. Um, feel free to message me, uh, you know, um, predominantly on, on LinkedIn, trying to avoid the other platforms. So do, try to message me on on, uh, on LinkedIn. And of course, I have my team scattered around all around the world. So um, anyone from Wix are more than happy to help. And uh, if you want to hear more, 
and how we can support, please let us know. Thanks, Paul. I appreciate you making time. I'm uh, excited to share this conversation with everyone. Cheers, Joe. Appreciate that. Thanks, everyone, for listening to today's episode. For more from Fit Insider, visit insider.fit.co and subscribe to our weekly newsletter for insights and analysis on the business of fitness and wellness. Then go ahead and subscribe, rate, and review the podcast. See you next time.